7 to 15. And when you pray, do not heap empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray like this then. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their, trespass, their trespasses, your Father, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. May God bless the reading of his word, and as Jeremy comes up to speak this morning. Just bow in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can gather together as your children. I just pray that this time of fellowship, of worship, and learning will be to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, everyone. I appreciate very much, uh, Randy, you talking a little bit about the Sunday school ministry downstairs. It sometimes is a little bit of a forgotten ministry. But for those of you uh, parents who were down there this morning, I don't know if you saw what I saw, but it was crazy down there. <laughs> There's a lot of kids, and they got a lot of energy. So say a quick prayer for your volunteers, because they are working hard down there. But it's awesome. Are you not thrilled about the amount of children and families we have here? It's amazing. Yeah. Of course, celebrate that. You know, there are, uh, uh, like, across Canada, you know, there's a lot of churches that are struggling and essentially dying off, and here we are with this uh, boom in our Sunday school ministries, and we don't even know where to put kids. Uh, we're constructing another room downstairs for a classroom because we need to split up the class. It's too big. Uh, these are the kinds of problems every church dreams of. Uh, although they still are problems, like we still, have to, we still have to build a room and we have to fund it and we have to staff it. So um, please get involved in the Kidsmen if you're not already and if that's something that uh, you're able to do because there's a huge need there for sure. Um, okay, let's get down to business. So yes, we are continuing in Matthew. Uh, I do want to mention that some of you may have noticed that we skipped a few verses. So last Sunday, we ended chapter 5, and this Sunday, we started chapter 6, but we jumped in at verse 7. And uh, if you caught that, good on you. What, uh, good job following along carefully. I do want to let you know that uh, this section of Scripture, Pastor Craig is going to backtrack a little bit next week and start at verse 1 and continue through uh, for a chunk of chapter 6. So we, we, he and I talked this week about how we were going to split this up. And so I'm, I'm taking this section here on the Lord's Prayer this morning. So just so you know, we're not skipping ahead. We will cover all the stuff. The Lord's Prayer, that's the topic for today. And I wrestled a lot with how to tackle this one because this prayer is so unbelievably rich it deserves its own sermon series. I mean, every sentence in this prayer communicates really deep and significant truths that deserve their own unpacking. Uh, this this uh, prayer covers a lot of different content. For example, the prayer that God's name be kept holy. Hallowed be thy name. I mean, that in and of itself deserves a lot of unpacking and attention. Uh, it talks about seeking the kingdom. May your kingdom come and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's something that, again, could use all kinds of uh, explanations and applications that we could uh, go on and on because that's almost the whole thrust of the Bible, really. Uh, we talk about daily provision, right? Give us this day our daily bread. In fact, I had preached a sermon uh, back in the springtime about daily bread. And so I've already actually taught recently on that very topic. Then there's, of course, the prayer for forgiveness. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who've trespassed against us. And 
Forgiveness is a huge thing, right? Being able to receive forgiveness from God and seek his forgiveness and also extend forgiveness to those who have wronged us. I mean, all of these things, they, they just deserve a, a ton of attention. And I can't do it, right? That's the challenge. It's like, I don't know how you cover that in one sermon. I don't think you do. Um, these uh, contents of the prayer they do teach us or instruct us about what our priorities should be. One of the things that you can do is take the way your prayers typically sound and then compare it against the prayer offered here that we call the Our Father. And you oftentimes will think, my prayers don't sound a lot like the Our Father. You know, it's not that the words or the verbiage has to be the same, but the priorities. You know, so often we are thinking about other things. Our mind is distracted with other things, and we're not praying about forgiving other people, and we're not praying about God meeting our needs, or we're not praying that his kingdom would come and his name would be kept holy. So it's very good to allow this prayer to reorient our priorities and our focus, not only in our prayer life, but also in our day-to-day lives. All of that to say, I'm probably not going to touch hardly on any of that. <laughs> I want to take a little bit of a different approach to this prayer by focusing on the opening comments that Jesus makes leading up to this prayer. I want to start, uh, before I reread that passage, by telling you a quick story. I was at a uh, men's get-together quite some time ago. I don't exactly know. It was probably 10 or 12 years ago, so a while ago. And uh, so the group of men got together, I think it was a Saturday morning, and uh, we had some fellowship, I think we maybe had breakfast. I remember there was a uh, devotional, and the focus of the devotional that morning was on prayer. And, you know, we worked through the devotional, we spent some time praying together, and then there was that conversation after uh, where everybody was kind of reflecting a little bit on what we had talked about that day. And what I found was that Everybody that I talked to anyways, the men who were sitting at my table, they all had a similar perspective, which is that they all felt guilty. (laughs) They all felt guilty about their prayer lives. And there was this time of reflection afterwards, and everybody had their own version of it, but but the kind of like consensus around the table is like, I really need to work on my prayer life. And the kinds of things people were saying is things like, you know, I, I try to pray in the morning before I go to work, but I just find that if I, you know, don't time it right, I'm rushed and I got to get out the door and I barely have time to pray. Or sometimes like my morning gets interrupted once my kids wake up or uh, I have to, I realize the plow went by and dumped a bunch of snow at the end of the driveway. So I got to get out there and tackle the snow before I leave and I don't have time to pray. Or things like, well, I, I try to pray at the end of the day and I just find so often I'm just too tired So I lay in bed, and I say like two things, the next thing you know, I'm passed out, and that's the end of it. Wake up the morning feeling guilty, like, oh, I I need to be more diligent about this, right? I need to muster up some self-discipline and pray better. Or other people say things like, well, you know, even if I set aside the time, I just find within two minutes, my mind is wandering to something else, and I can't focus long enough. Another thing that people sometimes say is they they forget to pray about things. So they'll have a conversation with somebody who will share some kind of a challenge they're going through. And what do we always say as Christians, right? I'll pray about that. Yeah, I'm going to pray about that. And then do we? So often we don't. We just totally forget. The evening comes. We've moved on with our day. Other things are on our mind. And then we never pray for the things that we tell people we would pray about. So everybody around this whole table, everybody was just feeling like, guilty. Like, my prayer life, you know, it's forgetful, it's distracted, it's too short, I'm falling asleep, I don't have time, and I just need to try harder. And I remember leaving that morning thinking, something is wrong with this picture. And I didn't necessarily know what it was, because there was part of me that resonated. I mean, I sympathize with these men because I feel the same way, like, whose prayer life couldn't use some work? Who couldn't use a little more self-discipline in their prayer life? And I just remember thinking, though, is that really the answer? Is just to try harder, to be more disciplined. And I'm not so sure that that's the answer. Jesus here gives us a little bit of a different perspective on prayer. How to have 
an active and thriving, meaningful, powerful prayer life that frees you from the burden of guilt and feeling like your prayer life is never quite up to snuff as it should be because he puts a whole new spin on it altogether. Let's start with talking about how this passage relates to our view of God. Let me reread it really quickly. Matthew 6, verses 7 and 8, before Jesus even teaches us the prayer itself, here's what he says. He says, When you pray, do not heap up empty phrases, as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. That's the phrase or the passage I really want to focus on this morning. Jesus here is saying that this group of people he's calling the Gentiles have a faulty view of God that wrongly alters their prayer life. He says that they, when they pray, they are heaping up empty phrases. And he explicitly follows that up by saying, don't do that. Don't be like them. What is it that Jesus is attacking here? What is the view of God that he is challenging in our thinking? Well, one of the things that we should focus on here is that there is a wrong assumption about God's nature present in this mindset. A wrong assumption about God's nature. The God that the Gentiles are praying to, they seem to assume he's not listening. That unless my prayers are are long and full of all kinds of repetition and the right phrases and I got to say the right thing and I really got to work hard at this in order to get God to hear me, that's when he actually listens to my prayers. They're just heaping up words on words and they think they'll be heard for their many words. And Jesus says, that's not how it works. That's not how it works. The assumption is God's not that interested in you. The assumption is God is distant. He's busy, right? He's distracted with other things. And if you want him to listen to you, you really got to work for it. That's the assumption. God is stingy, right? He withholds things unless you really work for it. And maybe then, once you've proven yourself through a long and arduous and committed prayer, then he'll come forward and grant you your request. Or the idea also might be that God is not that easily impressed with you, right? You offer up a little prayer and he looks at you and thinks, is that the best you got? I'm the God of the universe. If you want something from me, you better show me you're worth it. So then we take this and we adapt it into our prayer life through these long and exhausting prayers where we feel like we are taking God and we're putting him in an arm bar and trying to twist it until he taps out and finally gives us what he wants. That's the assumption that Jesus is attacking, that God just really doesn't care unless you work hard enough to get his attention. Is that what God is like? Is that the nature of God? No. See, God is not a God that you have to manipulate. God is not a God who's distant and disinterested and stingy, and he wants you to work really hard to impress him. It's the exact opposite. He's very interested in your life. He's close, not far. He's listening. He's not tuned you out. He's eager to help. He's not making you work for it. His nature is completely different. And Jesus talked about it as your heavenly father knows what you need before you ask him. When you go to God in prayer and you tell him something that you need, or you tell him some situation that's going on in your life, God's not caught off guard by that. It's not like, oh my gosh, I had no idea you were going through this. He's God, right? He sees all, he knows all. In fact, he's way more honest about your life than you are about your life. So when you go to God and you start praying, half the time he's thinking, you're not even being real with me right now. Like, I know what's going on, and it's way worse than what you're saying. So you might as well say it right? He knows. He's interested. He's paying attention. He cares. And he doesn't need you to manipulate him into action. He's actually very eager to move on your behalf. This is the nature of God. We need to understand that because when we understand it, it changes how we pray. Suddenly, 
our prayers don't feel like they have to be contrived. They don't feel like they have to have all the right words and that they don't have to be a certain length. They can just be what they are and God hears. Here's how it said in uh, James chapter 1, verse 5, talking about God's nature. It says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. I love that phrase. I love that passage. That is a Bible verse worth memorizing and incorporating into your prayer life. God, I don't have the wisdom to figure this out, but I know you do, and your word says if I ask, you'll give it. So help me out. Is God going to answer that prayer? Every time. Every time. But I love the way James here describes God. What does he say? God gives generously. Generous. Do you think about God as a generous giver, or do you think of him as a stingy person? Because that completely transforms how you pray. If your view of God is he withholds all of his good things until we really prove that we deserve it, then you're going to have to pray prayers that are long and manipulative, and you're going to really feel like this is a wrestling match with God, trying to make him do something he doesn't want to do. Instead, view God as one who gives generously. He's got open pockets, and he loves to give. He's generous. It makes his day to answer prayer and meet your needs. If you think of God that way, it completely changes the way you pray to him. I mean, if you are asking, from a human perspective, somebody for a loan, and you know this person is a bit of a Scrooge, (laughs) right? They're stingy. They're not generous. They don't like to give. You know what? You're probably going to be like, I got to have a whole game plan ready. I need to have a reason why they should give me this loan, how I'm going to pay it back. I'm going to have a chart, a presentation. I'm going to have graphs and handouts with footnotes. I'm going to really show this person that I'm worthy of that loan. Is that the God that we picture when we pray to him? Or do you picture a God who has generosity for all? He loves it, makes his day to give. Again, that completely changes the way you pray when you understand God is generous. And it also says, he gives generously to all without reproach. What that essentially means is, uh, that part there about being without reproach, is he doesn't guilt you for it, right? He gives generously without a heaping of guilt. Some people give generously, but they let you know it, right? They're like, oh, you're back for more again, huh? Okay, let me help you out again. You know, maybe next time, if you were a little more careful, you wouldn't need this. So they give, but they throw in a little salt to add to the wound, right? They let you know that they're going out of their way. Is that how God handles things? No. He says, oh, you're back for more? You need more? I'm here for you. You came to the right place. I'm happy to help. I'm not going to make you feel guilty for coming to me for more. If you have problems and you bring them to me, you keep coming back with all your problems and I will be here every time. I'll never make you feel guilty for that. That totally changes the way we pray. Suddenly you feel like, I can just keep coming back again and again and again, and God gives and gives and gives. Again, this totally changes the way we think about prayer. Understanding God's nature as a giver. Here's another verse to think about this uh, topic. Psalm 116, verses 1 and 2 says, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. Again, this is a phrase, a passage that's telling us God listens to your prayers. He has heard my voice and my pleas. He has inclined his ear to me. If you really think about what that means from a literal perspective, if you picture God like up in heaven, let's say, and you are praying to him, He's inclined his ear to you. He's bending over, listening carefully. What do you have to say? I'm all yours. I'm all ears. Talk to me. When you picture God that way, again, it totally changes the way we pray. Totally changes it. So Jesus here is is attacking this idea that deep down, God is distant, disinterested, stingy, difficult, 
and he's just not that generous with people, when in reality it's the exact opposite. So Jesus is saying, you don't have to heap up empty phrases. You don't have to pray long-winded prayers in order to have God hear what you have to say. He's already excited to hear from you, and he's already leaning forward in his chair, ready to move on your behalf. Approach him that way. The second thing that Jesus is challenging here is a faulty assumption about our relationship with God. Not just his nature, but also our relationship to him. Jesus here teaches his disciples to pray by referring to God as our Father. He says, your Father in heaven knows what you need, and when you pray, pray like this, our Father in heaven. Referring to God as a Father is actually a rather transformative way of thinking. See, primarily throughout the Old Testament, that's not how people prayed to God. That's not how they understood him. For the most part, people thought about God, and this is not necessarily wrong, as a king, as the creator, as the great divinity overall. So they emphasize God's greatness, right? He is God in the heavens. He is a king. He is the ruler. He is the Lord. He is the master, and we're his servants. And so when we came to him in prayer, primarily the way people have thought about it was, I am a servant approaching my master. And there is a very significant change in the relationship when you think of it that way versus when you think about it as a child approaching their father. It's totally different. And it's not untrue to say that God is a king. He is king, right? He is king of kings. He is lord of lords. He is the creator of all. And we ought to show him the respect he deserves. He is the God of our lives. He rules and reigns, right? Like, don't diminish him as less than he is. But what if your dad was the king? He's both, if you're a follower of Jesus. Picture it this way. Imagine a kingdom, vast and expansive. And you are, but a mere peasant. And you live on the outskirts in a tiny village and you need help, and you need to bring your message, a urgent request to the king. Here's the problem. I'm way over here, and the king is way over there, and he lives in this castle. He lives, you know, surrounded by guards, and I'm just a nobody, and who am I to approach the king? And suddenly you begin to think, how am I going to get my request to the king? I'm a nobody, and so then you have to start to get really creative, don't you, right? How can I approach the castle under the dark of night? How can I manipulate my way through the guards? How can I get into the building? How can I get up into his presence? And even then, how am I going to get him to listen to me? And it sounds like this exhausting, impossible task. Some of us think about prayer that way. It's as if there's this huge gap between us and the king, and we have no shot of ever getting to him. What if you're a child of the king? What if you live in the palace? What if you can go to him at 3 o'clock in the morning to wake him up and ask for a glass of water? You can, because you're a child of the king. He's your father. You're his son. You're his daughter. Again, this totally changes the dynamic of our prayer life. Rather than thinking about God as distant and unapproachable, we can waltz into his presence any time we want and he welcomes us gladly the way a loving father receives his child. So pray like that. That's what Jesus is teaching us to do. Pray like God is your father. 1 John 3, 1 says this, See what kind of love the father has given to us that we should be called children of God. That's a great verse. God loves you, and he is not just a king and you are his servant, because the Bible talks about that too. But another aspect of your relationship is that he has adopted you into his family. And even though he is a king, he is now your father and you are his adopted child, which means you have full access to him anytime you want, about anything you want, and he will show you nothing but love, the way a good father would his child. Do you pray like that? Because that's what Jesus is saying we should do. Approach God with that mentality. Again, I don't know anybody who has a loving father who they feel like 
I can't go to dad. See, that's the key, right? Some of us have relationships with our own fathers that are complicated. Uh, Some of us, we were abandoned by our father. Some of us were abused by our father. Some of us were neglected by our father. Some of us had a strange relationship with our fathers that was a bit unhealthy. And so then sometimes we take that relationship and we project it onto God when he calls himself our father, and it kind of messes things up. But here's the thing. Your heavenly father is perfect. He's the perfect dad. What would the perfect dad be like? Full of love and compassion for his children, present for them, interested in them, supportive of them, there to meet their needs, eager to show them how much he cares. That's what your father is like. So don't let whatever relationship problems you have in this life taint your view of your heavenly father. He's perfect. A great dad loves his kids and is there for them whenever they need it. That's how God loves us, that we should be called children of God. I think Hebrews might have this in mind. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Because it gives us a picture of what prayer might be like. It says, let us then... With confidence, draw near to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our times of need. I love that passage of approaching the throne with confidence, with confidence, right? God is not just our father. He is the king and he is great and he is mighty and he is ruler of all. He sits on a throne, not just an earthly throne, but a throne over the heavens, And so there can be a little bit of hesitation, right? Like, who am I to enter into his presence? The Bible here says, do it with confidence, understanding that he's for you, not against you, that he's generous, not stingy, that he's your father, not some distant ruler who doesn't care you like a peasant out in the woods. Approach God in prayer like that. Again, this all completely shapes the way we pray. Because so many people, I find, are looking for guidelines, I guess you could say, on prayer. Things like, well, how often should I pray? Should I pray in the morning, in the evening? Is that good enough? How long should I pray? In fact, in my prep for this sermon, I decided to test out Google and see what it said. And I typed in, how long should I pray? Right? And all this stuff popped up. And the most common thing that I found was something like, Your prayers should be at least 15 minutes long. You should at least try and start there. And if you can stretch it out to an hour, that's better. That's the most common thing that I found. And I just thought, like, no. I mean, don't get me wrong. If you want to pray for 15 minutes, go for it. If you want to pray for an hour, amen. Like, I'm not trying to stop you. But the idea that we have to put a timer on this, right, as if that's what God is interested in, In fact, one of the recommendations said, set a timer for 15 minutes and don't stop praying until it goes off. I just thought like, okay, all right, let's think about this for a second. We have a relationship with God, right? That's what this is. It's a relationship. It's not just religious duties. We have a relationship. Imagine uh, that you went to your spouse and you're like, I want to spend some quality time with you. One second. Pull up your little timer. 15 minutes. How was your day, honey? You know, you talk for a few minutes, and all of a sudden you're like, we still have seven more minutes. We got to fill this up with something. Do you think your spouse would be like, yeah, this isn't it. Like, (laughs) uh, this is not quality time. This is not what I'm after. It doesn't matter. And I'm getting ahead of myself. (laughs) I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, Here's what I want to do. I want to end the rest of the sermon by giving you Three things that your prayers can be based on what the text says here today. So the first one is this. Your prayers can be short. Your prayers can be short. Uh, this past week, as I was uh, you know, prepping for this sermon, I sat at the dinner table with my family, and I asked my kids, I said, uh, how did I phrase it? Oh, yeah, I said, does God like it more if our prayers are short or, lo- or long? Do you like it more if our prayers are short or long? And of course, this was a bit of a trick question, right? And I was, uh, I was impressed because there was hesitation, right? Nobody just blurted out, oh, he wants the long prayer. There was kind of like, well, I don't know. And 
maybe both, you know? And I think it was Bella who said, it doesn't matter as long as it comes from the heart. Yeah, amen. I thought, that's exactly right. I'm doing okay. (laughs) That's the point, isn't it? It doesn't matter. If your prayer is one minute, five minutes, ten minutes, an hour, three hours, Jesus one time prayed all night long. If that's what you need to do, then do it. A lot of times we feel guilty that our prayers aren't long enough. That's not how God thinks. The point is not to fill up a time slot in order to impress God as if our lesser short prayers are not sufficient enough. Short prayers count too. That's perfectly fine. Sometimes they're the most earnest, right? That's what I think was lacking a little bit when I was in that men's you know, meeting talking about prayer. Everybody feeling guilty that their prayers just weren't long enough was kind of like this idea that longer is better, right? If I'm more focused, uh, that's better. Well, not necessarily. The Our Father prayer this is the one thing nobody's ever mentioned in my entire life, is four sentences long. That tells me a prayer that's four sentences long can be pretty darn great, especially if it's informed by the truth of God's word and if it comes from the heart. A a four-sentence prayer, God loves that. Jesus actually tells us, pray this way. I'll give you an example of this in action in the Bible. Um, so, a little bit of backstory, real quick. There's a book in the Old Testament called Nehemiah. And the story is that Nehemiah is an Israelite who loves the Lord. Uh, his people, the Israelites, are taken into captivity and now they're serving in a foreign nation. Nehemiah is actually the cupbearer to the king in this foreign nation. So they've totally lost track of what's going on back in their homeland until word comes to Nehemiah one day that the city of Jerusalem has been completely destroyed, right? The city of God is is in shambles. The walls are broken down. It's burned down. It's in a big pile of rubble. And this, of course, distresses Nehemiah greatly, and God begins to burden him with a desire to go back and rebuild the city. But here's what happened at the beginning of the book. Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 2 and following, it says this, The king said to me, Why is your face sad, seeing that you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. He's afraid because you're not supposed to be sad in the king's presence. I said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, what are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, see that you send me to Judah, the city of my father's grave, so I may rebuild it. I don't know if you caught that. Nehemiah prayed mid conversation, right? Between the time of the king asking, What do you want? And Nehemiah requesting a leave of absence, it says he prayed. Now let me just, this is not a trick question. How long do you think that prayer was? Okay. I mean, I think it's pretty unrealistic to think Nehemiah just said, hold that thought. And he walked over to the corner and he knelt down and bowed his head and he spent 15 minutes, set his little timer or the sundial or whatever, right? And then came back and asked the request. He probably did something like this. Lord, help me out. Here's my answer. I mean, it had to be something like that, right? I mean, a small pause mid-conversation. Did God grant that request? Yeah, he did. The king gave him favor. King said, I will let you not only take a leave of absence, I'll fund the rebuild myself. So God answered that prayer generously, and it was probably two seconds long. Friends, build that into your life. I think that is the key, or one of the keys, to a thriving prayer life, is to not think, I have to store up all my prayer time for the end of the day, or I have to knock it all out at the beginning of the day. Just pray like this. As things come to mind, pray about it on the spot, and accept 
that very short, very simple prayers are very pleasing in his sight. It was effective. Your prayers don't have to be long to be effective. They just have to be genuine. And they do have to be guided by Scripture and God's will. Don't get me wrong. What we pray about does matter, but the length is not the issue. It's not. If Nehemiah can pray mid-sentence, so can you. How many of you, before you make a phone call, think, Lord, just give me the words to say, boop, and then call? Or when somebody, I don't know, approaches you and says, can I talk to you about something? Just say, Lord, give me wisdom. What can I do for you? Totally do that. I mean, that is revolutionary. Or when somebody says, this is what's going on in my life. And, uh, you know, you say, you think to yourself, well, I need to pray about that. Just do it right there. Or when you're driving home and you realize you forgot to pray about it and you think about it right then in the car, pray right then. Don't wait till you get home and it's nine o'clock at night. Just do it on the spot. It doesn't have to be long, arduous, wordy. It just has to be sincere. Because God has his ear inclined to you. He's already listening. So your prayers can be short. Number two, your prayers can be sporadic. Spread out throughout the day. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. We all know these verses. It says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now that verse 17 part, pray without ceasing. Let me ask you this question. How do you actually obey that? If the Bible says, pray without ceasing, never stop praying. If the only kind of prayer you have in your mind is one where you are secluded in a closet or in your room, down on your knees, praying diligently, head bowed, eyes closed, hands together. If that's the only kind of prayer you can conceive of, you'll never, com- you'll never ever be able to obey that. Pray without ceasing? You'll be thinking, I go hours and hours and hours without uttering a word to God. So that can't be the only way to pray. I'm not saying it's wrong to do that. I think it's a good habit. But that can't be the only way to pray. The only way to pray without ceasing is to intersperse prayer throughout your day. Rather than thinking, I have a 15-minute time slot I ought to fill, or an hour if I'm really trying to be whatever, impressive, just think, I'm going to pray all day. As things come to mind, I'm just going to pray about it. As things happen, I'm just going to pray about it. As I read things, as I get phone calls and text messages, and as I interact with other people, I'm just going to pray about it right there on the spot. It's like that line of communication is always open. I think that's the only way to actually obey this command, to pray without ceasing. Same thing, Romans 12, 2 says, Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, and be constant in prayer. Again, how do you do that if the only kind of prayer you can conceive of is a very structured, long-winded, minimum 15-minute prayer? You can't do that constantly. You have a life to live, right? It's okay to actually fulfill your life obligations. You know, this idea that, I'm going to challenge this idea. This is controversial. I've heard people say things like, you can never pray too much. And I actually would say, yeah, you can. Um, Because if your idea of prayer is that you have to fill an hour, two hours, or longer in order to be righteous, it's like, well, who's doing the dishes? (laughs) Who's spending time with your children, right? Who's evangelizing? Who's running things? Who's working the job? Who's tending to your family? Like, other things have to happen, right, in order to fulfill all that God has given you to do. I hope the main thing you're getting out of this is an alleviation of guilt. This idea that, oh, my prayer, you don't have to twist his arm. Short, simple, direct prayers work just fine. So intersperse them throughout your day. The last thing I want to point out is that our prayers can not need to be sincere. In fact, this is probably the main issue Jesus has with what he called the Gentiles at the beginning, that they heap up empty phrases thinking they'll be heard for their many words. I think Jesus is implying they're not even hardly paying attention to what they're saying. Their heart's not in it. They're just mindlessly repeating things, probably over and over. 
and that's not sincere. You know, one of the things that I do struggle with as a parent is I do, with my own kids, get into a bit of a prayer rut, meaning when I pray with my kids at bed or when we pray at the dinner table, I do tend to use a lot of the same phrases over and over again, and the danger in doing that is that you just start to just say words, right? You're not actually thinking about what you're saying. You're not meaning it from the heart. You're just saying grace for the meal using the same terms you always use, and it starts to come off as a bit insincere. So I try every now and then to switch it up and really throw in a different way of saying things, just to challenge myself and also my kids to remember, like, I'm talking to God right now. You know, this isn't just some ritual that we do. This isn't just about a habit. We're talking to God, our Father. Um, There's nothing wrong necessarily with repetition in prayer. One of the reasons I say that is, if you remember, when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, merely hours before he's about to be crucified, it says that he went there with his disciples and prayed, and it actually says that he prayed the same thing three times, right? He asked his disciples, sit with me and pray that you would not enter temptation. It says he went a little way farther, fell down on the ground, and prayed, Lord, If you can take this cup away from me, please do. But nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will be done. And it says he prayed that prayer three times. So it's okay to repeat things in prayer. That's okay. The point is, you have to mean it. It can't be mindless repetition. I'm not trying to be critical by saying this. It's just my experience, but I did uh, in elementary school, how am I doing? Went to, I went to a Catholic elementary school, and one of the things that we were, you know, I, I just remember this part of being our religious class was uh, the rosary. Some of you are familiar with the Catholic rosary, and it's kind of this necklace-looking thing, and it's got a bunch of beads all the way around, and the way the rosary works is every bead on that chain represents a prayer. And you're supposed to hold that bead, say the prayer, and then you go to the next bead, say that prayer, go to the next bead, say that prayer. And I think there's a lot of great intention behind that, you know, to have a structure to your prayer and to to pray the same way some of your peers are praying. And like, I, I get it. There's some good things to that. The downside that I experienced was it just became totally mindless repetition, especially because There's this one section where you pray 10 Hail Marys in a row, and then the Our Father, and then another 10 Hail Marys, and then Our Father, and then 10 Hail Marys, and then Our Father. So in class, we would practice this, right? And I'm just going to do it. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now at the hour of death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. And you do that 10 times in a row. Am I actually thinking about what I'm saying? No. Is God happy about that? Well, certainly not the way I was doing it, I'll tell you that much, because my heart was not it. And I mean, we're not Catholics, so we don't pray to Mary anyways. But then you'd pray the Our Father, Our Father, you know, and you just do it. And it's like, I would never talk to my dad that way. (laughs) So why would I pray to my father that way? Again, I'm not trying to be critical. Uh, I'm not trying to criticize the Catholic Church or anything like that. It's not the point. Because we do it too. Us, us Protestants, we do it too. We repeat the same. Oh, yeah, how many, <laughs> dare I do it? <laughs> how many of us, right, you're at a prayer time in a small group or something like that, and there's always that one person who, who says, Father God, a hundred times <laughs> in their prayer. And I'm not trying to be mocking, but I mean, it's a bad habit, right? They just keep repeating the same thing in the prayer over and over. And it's like, you would never talk to your dad that way. You don't talk to anybody that way. Why do we talk to God that way? That's a bit bit of a bad habit. Mindless repetition, heaping up of empty phrases. God's listening. He loves you. He cares about you. He's paying attention. He's generous and eager to invest himself in your life. So talk to him that way. Your prayers do need to be sincere. So I would say it is a little bit ironic that the Our Father, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, It's a little bit ironic that people repeat that prayer word for word only because I don't think that was the point. 
think Jesus was giving us like a bit of a, a sample of what a prayer might sound like. I don't think he was saying, repeat after me. Because once you get into the habit of repeating things over and over, it just becomes empty words. Don't pray to God empty words. Pray from your heart. Because this is a relationship. Psalm 62, verse 8 says this. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. There's a huge difference between mindless repetition or an empty filling of 15 minutes and pouring out your heart before God. It's not the same thing. It doesn't matter if you do 15 minutes. It doesn't matter. None of that matters. The Bible says, pour out your heart. Tell him what's on your mind. Tell him your struggles. Tell him your anxieties. Tell him your fears. Confess your sins. Talk to him about the things that consume your mind at night. Talk to him in the night. Talk to him in the morning. Talk to him in the car. Talk to him at work. Talk to him whenever you want. He's there. Pour out your heart before him, and may your prayer be sincere, because this, at the end of the day, is a relationship. I want to just close by reading a quote from Charles Spurgeon. He says this, True prayer is measured by weight, not length. A single groan before God may have more fullness of prayer in it than a fine oration of great length. Pour out your heart to God because he's listening. The greatest need that each and every one of us have, Jesus mentioned in his prayer, is forgiveness. Each and every one of us, We don't live our lives the way God wants us to. We do disobey the king. We do disobey our father. And the beauty is God's nature is gracious. He's kind and loving and he's compassionate. And he has grace for sinners like you and I. So through what Jesus has done for us, by dying on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin, we are adopted into God's family and we start a new relationship with him like a child and a father. Friends, if you have not yet cried out to God to be real to you and to have that kind of father-child relationship with you, I want you to understand it comes through Jesus Christ. He is the one who has made a way where there was no way. And Jesus himself said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Through Jesus, you can have a relationship with God be adopted into his family, united to your brothers and sisters in faith, and it completely transform your life. So that prayer becomes not a task to be checked off your to-do list. It becomes an ongoing conversation with the one who made you. And that's what it's all about. I'm going to invite uh, Peter to come forward and lead us in a time of communion. And why don't you all stand and their servers can take their spots now. Thank you, Jeremy.